and welcome to part one of the Howard FM converter alignment video and you're probably saying what the heck that doesn't look like the Howard FM unit and you'd be absolutely right this is the pilot receiver AM receiver that I restored some time ago I've thrown it up on the bench just so we can do a very quick brief rehash of the what the AM IF sweep looks like <clears throat> excuse me so we're set up with our step attenuator over here we have the AM receiver and before anyone screams at me no these are not the old waxy capacitors these are the shells of the old waxy capacitors with orange drops slid inside and the ends are then sealed up with hot snot glue and it gives the appearance that everything in there is stock. A lot of these capacitors were actually sprags and the spray orange drops are replacing the inside guts so I felt pretty good about that but just about every capacitor, well virtually every capacitor in here was seriously leaky with two exceptions and I'm gonna get yelled at for this this pilot branded filter and this pilot branded electrolytic filter I believe are the originals from late 40s early 50s in this set now I took these out initially because I did buy replacements and out of curiosity I ran some tests on them turns out these were actually better than the brand new caps that I had purchased to replace them. The ESR was actually a little bit better on these two capacitors. Absolutely no leakage whatsoever that I could detect on my Sencor, my Heath kit, my Solar capacitor checkers. I've got three different capacitor testers and I have an ESR meter that's separate from that. So the power factor, quote unquote, which is the old method of calling uh, ESR, it was called power factor, on my Heath kit and my Solar show it to be perfect and leakage on my Sencor and my two capacitor checkers there are virtually no leakage on these caps, they were just perfect, they were as good as brand new filter caps. I then took, they were out of the radio, I then took and put the full working voltage on them which is a couple hundred volts and let them sit on a power supply at full working voltage for about 48 hours just to see if they break down and at the end of the test they were perfect I put them back in I'm keeping this radio for myself anyway so I will you know when I at the first hint of hum or problems I'll swap them out but right now I'm leaving them in because they are pilot branded they are the original filters and they are perfect okay enough said about that up here we have our arbitrary waveform generator synthesized arbitrary waveform generator which we're using as a sweep generator this is not a dedicated sweep generator and this is not its actual intended purpose but it does have the function to use it as a sweep generator built in but because it's a 12-bit uh, converter inside you probably noticed in the last video and even on this one you'll see that there are individual segments on the screen here that's because this is sweeping at 20 Hertz 20 cycles per second and every time it's doing that it's synthesizing the sweep frequencies in 99 segments so it's synthesizing a segment of the frequency stopping, recalculating, synthesizing another piece and it's putting them together as a string of independent dots and that's why it looks a little bit choppy but it does work. The reason this is on the screen as you may notice this is off to the side it's not where our 455 kilohertz marker is and this is again because of the AVC, the automatic volume control affecting the tuning and I'm hoping, I can't tell in the viewfinder here, I'm hoping you can clearly see the voltmeter that is monitoring the AVC voltage. Right now my signal level is very low and the center of my IF tuning is off to the side. Now I'm going to increase the signal level. You will see the 
ABC level begin to increase as I take out attenuation and notice now we're back in the center of the 455 kilohertz as our AVC voltage comes up and affects the capacitance of the tubes. So on this receiver as well as the old one you have a very clear and distinct difference in the center of where the IF falls. Now it's still off center a little bit. I am going to remove the voltmeter the loading from the voltmeter and you probably just saw that shift over more towards the center. Even though that's a 10 mega ohm voltmeter it loads the AVC voltage enough to affect the tuning of the IF strip. So just be aware of that when you're tuning these radios to keep your levels low enough or manually control the AVC. But we see how steep or how pointed this tuning curve is on this IF transformer which is limiting our bandwidth here. Now with the FM we can't do that. We have to have a much much wider bandwidth. Your AM broadcasters here in the United States have a 10 kilohertz spacing. In other words they have 10 kilohertz of channel spacing and they're allowed a maximum of 5 kilohertz um, audio bandwidth each side which equals your 10 kilohertz but in reality they usually limit it to about four four and a half kilohertz of bandwidth just so that they're not uh, leaking into the next channel and they don't get into trouble. FM is on a 200 kilohertz bandwidth spacing or uh, excuse me uh, channel spacing and typically they modulate at about 150 kilohertz bandwidth so they have 75 kilohertz each side of the set, uh, center frequency and that gives them some guard band on either side to account for side bands yada yada. We covered all of this uh, in a previous video. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. If you go back through my videos you'll find ones on uh, AM modulation, FM modulation and bandwidth and so on and so forth. At any rate AM is tuned fairly sharply because it doesn't need nearly as much bandwidth as FM does. We will be tuning for a double hump on the FM but just so it's fresh in your mind that this is the AM peaked tuning it can be tuned wider like I did in my last video series but we will be shooting for something much wider for the FM version. I am going to clean all of this off the bench. We are going to be using an actual analog sweep generator, an old precision uh, equipment, uh, precision apparatus company, excuse me, precision apparatus company, analog sweep generator. And we'll be using this one. I have three of them presently. We also have this version. as well as this version. All three of these do the same job. All of them do a fairly good job of it. The trick is that these tend to be broad tuning and they drift. We get around that by having very distinct and clear marker frequencies set up. We mark the frequencies or I mark the frequencies using these crystals that I have custom ground for the center of the IF at 10.7 and then 75 kilohertz higher at 10.775 and 75 kilohertz lower at 10.625. The two signal generators that I am not using, the first ones, this is one of them and this is the other one actually have a very convenient four position switch so you can plug in all of your crystals at once and merely switch in between them. This newer version only has a single crystal socket which means I have to swap crystals however it has the built-in uh, marker adder which is a nice feature. Not absolutely necessary you can simply add your markers 
with a, sen uh, a signal generator and it doesn't have to be anything very fancy it just has to be fairly well or fairly, fairly accurately tuned easy for me to say by setting this at 10.7 megahertz and injecting it into the signal coming out of our sweep generators we can add our markers to the screen and we'll know where the center of our 10.7 is even if this oscillator uh, drifts a little bit we just retune to put the marker in the center of the sweep and we know that's our 10.7 megahertz IF center frequency if you buy one of these sweep generators and you don't have any crystals for it and you can't find them anywhere and finding them for these specific frequencies I've never been able to come across them. The original crystals that came with those units were lost long ago. Don't despair. You buy this one uh, was a 10.3 megahertz or slightly below 10.3 megahertz. You use the second harmonic, so you bought or not 10.3, excuse me, 5.3. Actually, it was like 5.295 megahertz, and I just reground it slightly and moved it up so that its second harmonic is 10.7 megahertz. These work very well on the second overtone with these precision marker adders. Trying to get crystals in the 10 megahertz region is tough, but finding them in the 5 megahertz or 4.5 or 4.8 megahertz, whatever is close to being uh, half of the frequency you want, they're fairly common. A lot of uh, old military gear used 4 megahertz crystals or 4.5 megahertz or 4.3 or 4.2. There's a lot of military frequencies down there. These crystals are in, there's an abundance of them on eBay, and they're relatively inexpensive. And there are there are many tutorials on YouTube about grinding crystals. It's not difficult; just takes a little bit of patience. You grind them on a piece of like six or eight hundred grit sandpaper on a piece of glass. Clean them well. Put them back in. Test the frequency. If you overshoot, again, don't despair. You put a little pencil mark on the piece of quartz and it will lower the frequency back down a little bit. Simple process, just takes patience. So, we'll put the crystals there for now. I'm going to clean off the bench. We are going to shut off this generator because we won't be using it for the FM converter. We'll be using the precision sweep generator, the analog unit here. I'll get this radio off the bench and put away. We'll still be using our attenuator most likely. It's a lot handier to use this attenuator than it is to keep reaching across the bench and turning a knob up and down. So I'll set the signal generator fairly high on its output and do my attenuation here. These are fairly inexpensive if you get them at the flea markets. I think I paid $30 for this one. I believe I paid about $40 for this one. This one's good up through the gigahertz region, I think. Yeah, 2.9 gigahertz, where the other one's only good to about 1.2 gigahertz. Second hand in the flea markets, Again, pretty reasonable. So let's get going. I'm going to pick stuff up. I'm going to put stuff, uh, put the radio back together. We'll get going here on the Howard. Memorial Day for Biden. It's the first one outside his Delaware home since the lockdown. Okay, one last tip before I move on to the Howard. Vacuum tubes are not being made anymore. They are going to, you know, someday get very scarce and rare. Fortunately, there still seems to be a, a decent supply of new old stock, as well as good pulls from defunct equipment available, although prices are starting to climb uh, ridiculously high. But someday we're not going to have any more tubes. Somebody will probably have to start inventing solid state replacements for these sets like they did for the Zenith Transoceanics. 
you can buy uh, little seven pin miniature glass envelopes look just like a tube but they're full of solid state electronics for the transoceanics what I do to try to preserve it or preserve them this set has a very good set of tubes in it the emission on them is they're like brand new tubes to preserve that I have changed the 35L6 output tube to a 50L6, dropping the string voltage or increasing its capacity to handle voltage by 15 volts. In other words, everything's running a little bit cooler than it used to. My thought is it'll help preserve the cathodes of the tubes and extend their life. That's my theory, anyway and should the tubes ever get a little bit soft you could always drop a 35 L6 back in there and boost the filament string a little bit and recover some of that lost emission so it's just a thought uh, in my mind it's going to preserve the tubes a little bit longer to keep them running a little bit cooler and the difference between a 6 L6 a uh, 25L6, a 35L6, and a 50L6 is nothing more than the filament voltage. Uh, the tubes are identical other than that, but by putting the 50L6, it uh, lets the string, uh, let's put it this way, it stresses the string a little bit less on modern 125 or 128 line voltage. These sets were initially built, uh, the common voltage was 110. And over the years it snuck up to 115 now most neighborhoods have between 125 and 127 mine runs between 125 and 128 so I like to run the uh, the 50L6s in there and uh, just take some of the stress off the tubes just my opinion let's move on and here is the chassis in all its glory it's in not great shape but not awful shape except for the back this unit had to have been fairly expensive it uses piston trimmers it's using top shelf components just about everywhere it's really nicely built it's got a compartment between the power supply audio amp and the RF section. The main issue with this unit is the back, which is very rusty, <clears throat> and I've been agonizing over this. I have wanted to sand this down, mask everything off, and paint it. But I've been agonizing over the fact that there's so much silk screening on the back that's going to disappear. <clears throat> and it says, see instruction card on bottom. This says record changer pickup. And it points to this grounding screw G2. This input terminal P for phonograph. There's another arrow here. This says built in an A for antenna and that's what this white wire is 115 volts 60 cycles AC G1 so ground one ground two over here it says two radio phono terminals however I have seen David Tipton fellow over in Australia who does a lot of uh, restoration he does great jobs you should watch his videos check out his channel David Tipton and here's his uh, home screen or opening screen <clears throat> excuse me I'm losing my voice he goes so far often to remove the power transformers take them out clean up the chassis paint everything put them back together and put the transformers back in quite frankly I'm not that brave the potential for disaster having these 50 60 70 year old uh, wires which get very brittle with time 
break all the insulation to fall off and have to dig inside the transformer and rewire new uh, you know put new wiring in it it's just so risky I just wish I had his nerve <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'll probably take the hardware out and either clean it up and paint it or just outright replace it sand up what I can mask everything off paint it and I'm going to try what I saw him do is make some decals on a laser printer you soak them in water just like you had when you were uh, building models as a kid and slide the decals into place it won't be original at that point but it's going to be a lot nicer looking than this rusty surface I really hate losing the original silk screen however Hiring a company or paying a company to make a silk screen, I think there's a non recurring charge of probably like $500 to have a silk screen made just for one piece. It's you know, if you're having a thousand or ten thousand units made, that $500 gets amateurized across all your product and it's not very expensive. But when you're trying to do a restoration like this, it just doesn't pay. I thought about stick on labels. I'm not happy with that thought. I've got plenty of label making equipment. I want to try to emulate this as much as possible. It uh, The lettering is in brown and it was against the original zinc. I'm assuming it was zinc. It doesn't look like now. It's not nickel. It's either zinc or cadmium and uh, I'll just spray paint it silver. I'll sand everything down, spray paint it silver and put the clear decals with brown letters back on. It would, it's going to look similar to original. At any rate, we'll move on. We'll hook up the test equipment and start doing the IF alignment on this receiver.